Once upon a time, when you and I hear that phrase, we tend to lean forward, our ears perk up, we know that we're about to hear a story. Stories have a way of drawing us into them. Jesus was a master storyteller. As we continue our sermon series on some of the lesser-known parables of Jesus, today's text reminds us that there were periods of Jesus' earthly ministry where he did hardly anything but tell stories. And today we see him spin a short yarn about mustard. Now, in the baseball world, a show-off, a showboat, we call them hot dogs. And we used to rag on them during a game and say, put some mustard on that guy and sell him in the stands. By the way, that's the only thing that rightly should go on a hot dog. I cringe when I see my kids put ketchup on their hot dogs. Well, what does Jesus have to say to you and me today about mustard? Let's take a look. Turn with me in your Bibles and keep them open to Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, as we look this morning at verses 30 through 34. But let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now hear God's word as we find it beginning to read at verse 30 of Mark chapter 4. And Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Let's pray again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once upon a time, once upon a time, a Higgs boson particle walked into a Roman Catholic church on a Sunday morning, and an usher looked at him and said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, you can't have mass without me. Now, if you're up to snuff in the world of physics, you got that little story, and you're chuckling. But if you're not up to snuff in the world of physics, you're thinking, what in the world did that have to do with anything? Well, in verses 33 and 34 of our text, we see that not everybody got Jesus' stories. In fact, he oftentimes had to pull his own disciples aside and explain to them what the story was really all about. And so, are you getting this mustard seed thing this morning? How in the world can the kingdom of God be likened to a mustard seed? Well, it takes about 21,000 mustard seeds to weigh just one ounce. So you can see they're very, very, very tiny. Um, They're about the size of the head of a pin. But one mustard seed can grow into a plant as much as 15 feet high with branches where birds can come and make their nests. If nothing else, this parable reminds you and me to never disdain the little things of God. One of the the counterintuitive things about the Christian faith is we have this vast, almighty, majestic, magnificent, big, gigantic God, and yet this God oftentimes chooses to start with the small, to do magnificent things through insignificant, seemingly obscure things. Once upon a time, an egg was miraculously fertilized in the womb of a young Jewish virgin. And the Messiah, the Savior of the entire world, emerged. Once upon a time, 
It looked like to a lot of people just one more amongst many thousands of Roman crucifixions. And yet on that particular cross, the blood was shed that covered the sins of the entire world. Once upon a time, there was a little obscure Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. And here we are at the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation this year. And Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door there in Wittenberg. And the Reformation began. But not only the Reformation, but really Western civilization. Once upon a time... In the wake of the Watergate scandal, a White House staffer was convicted and sent to prison. But before he was locked up, a friend gave him a copy of C.S. Lewis's little book, Mere Christianity. And the man read it. He came to Christ. And when he was released, Chuck Colson started Prison Fellowship. And tens of thousands of prisoners around the world have come to Christ through that ministry. Once upon a time, 40 years ago, I was a summer intern here at First Pres, and I was watching on the sidelines as our Christian assistance ministry, CAM, was birthed. And it looked pretty mom and pop. And I remember thinking, is this going to go anywhere? Is this really going to get any traction and make any difference in people's lives? And now, 40 years later, over 50,000 people a year receive the hope and the love of Jesus Christ. Today might look like just one more insignificant ordinary day to you. Yeah, it's the day of Pentecost, but so what? Maybe you're sitting here this morning feeling like God is distant or maybe he doesn't even exist. You look around at the culture and it seems like the church of Jesus Christ is powerless against the powers that be. And yet, if today is just an average day, 10,000 people will come to Christ in Latin America. 10,000 more will come to Christ on the continent of Africa. Another 10,000 will come to Christ just in the nation of China. If you're ever tempted to think that the Holy Spirit still isn't powerfully at work in our world, just think about those statistics. There are more Presbyterians in Malawi than in the U.S. and Scotland combined. Why? Because once upon a time, one little lone missionary named David Livingston risked everything in an obscure place in the world and became the first white person to penetrate the interior of Africa. And when he did so, he took with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And millions and millions of lives have been transformed. Don't ever disdain the little things of the Lord, even a mustard seed. In fact, you may be looking at your own life and thinking, I'm, I'm not really doing much for the kingdom. I just do these little things once in a while for people in the name of Christ. My friends, a little thing done for the Lord is never a little thing. You have no idea what God might do with that. Do not disdain when you come to this table today. A, a, a paper-thin wafer in a, dipped in a little bit of wine, can that possibly really make any difference in your life? Who here knows the name Mordecai Ham? Probably none of you. It was just one more off-the-radar preaching mission in Charlotte, North Carolina back in the 1930s. Except one night, a little boy wandered into the preaching tent. And for him, it was the day of Pentecost. Mordecai Ham preached an insignificant sermon, and yet it was that night that the Holy Spirit broke open that little boy's heart. And the result is millions and millions of people who have come into the kingdom. That little boy was Billy Graham. And I'm one of the millions. Don't ever disdain 
the little things of God. We have to ask the question, where do you and I fit into this parable? Where are we in this parable? I'll tell you. We're the birds in the branches. You and I don't start the kingdom of God. We don't build the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes to us as gift, sheer gift, gift of grace. It's the kingdom of God that supports us, not vice versa. But when the Holy Spirit regenerates your heart and my heart, then we become a part of that kingdom. We become little pieces of that kingdom. The kingdom comes for, becomes for us our shelter and our shade, our, the perch for our lives. And who knows? A small word spoken by you and me for Jesus. Just a little word. Who knows how the Holy Spirit might then bring another bird onto the branch. Whenever I think of the mustard seed in this parable, I can't help but also think of what Jesus calls mustard seed faith. Over 38 years, I've done hundreds and hundreds of funerals. And I'll tell you, the hardest funeral to do is that of the person that seems to have little, if any, connection to Christ. Maybe all they have is their name on a church roll. And every time I'm confronted with that situation, I dig down deep and I say, well, at some point in that person's life, they made some sort of commitment toward Jesus Christ. And I started asking myself the question, how much faith or how little faith can save you and me? And I start thinking about Jesus' phrase, mustard seed faith. And then I go on, I'll be honest with you, I go on and I preach that person's funeral as if they were Billy Graham, because the reality, my friends, is that your faith and my faith do not save us. You can have all this faith in the world, it's not enough to save you. The only faith that can save you and me is the faith of Jesus Christ himself. And so, how much or how little of Christ's faith does it take to save someone? I'm not exactly sure. All I can say is never disdain the little things of God. How did God create the world? Was it with the Big Bang? I don't know, I wasn't there. But it would certainly fit this parable. The Big Bang Theory posits that at a certain point in time, all of the matter in the universe was condensed into one super dense pinpoint, and boom. Who knows how God can use even mustard seed faith? I'm not endorsing mustard seed faith. I'm not encouraging you to have mustard seed faith. Please, if I ever have to bury you, don't make me have to have a magnifying glass to try to find your mustard seed. Um, no. If you have mustard seed faith, don't stay there. Fertilize it. Water it. Like in the parable, it can and it will grow. You are to be a part a visible part of the kingdom of God on earth. And so, my friends, when, when you and I die, let's do so with birds in our branches. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.